Welcome to The Whole Pineapple. I'm Ruby Boris. And I'm Ann Judge. The Whole Pineapple is a podcast about wellness focused around fertility. And on these weekly mini episodes, we bring you bite-sized ideas for you to snack on. Like breathing exercises, book reviews, maybe we'll review some scientific research, or we'll share some wellness and fertility stories from our listeners. So if you're looking for a tip or a trick related to your fertility and well-being, then you've come to the right place. Let's dig in. All right, welcome back to the whole pineapple. I'm Ann Judge. Yay, my favorite time of the year. <laughs> and we are here for book club. <laughs> we thought it is a topical to go into the history of the birth of the pill. And we had early on, we were planning a podcast, I think some article that came up back when we were talking about hormones and progesterone, we're like, oh, we should do a deep dive into the pill. And luckily, there's this great book titled The Birth of the Pill, How Four Crusaders Reinvented Sex and Launched a Revolution. Jonathan Ike. Jonathan Ike. And so Ruby and I started reading it a while ago, and I think both had similar experiences of kind of getting <laughs> bogged down a bit in the middle. And then like the true nerds that we are putting <laughs> off finishing the book until <laughs> two days before we were going to podcast record. And then both have powered through the whole last half of the book in the last two days. Well, that's where the action happened. It is. I was like, actually, I really enjoyed this book. And I needed to just kind of plow through the, the middle sections a little bit. Well, it does kind kind of mirror what it was like to get mm -hmm. a birth control pill into existence. It was a lot of painstaking, trudging through the mud, trying to get this to happen. And there's a lot of skirting the lines and making things happen, even if it wasn't quite the most ethically sound. It's a sordid history. <laughs> sordid history. And as this book really does outline is it wouldn't be here yeah. for some of these things. Um, and of course, there are a lot of things that we certainly wouldn't condone in today's kind of medical research and things like that. And there are some controversial parts of this story, but it is very interesting to see it all laid out and to talk about some of the characters that you may not have heard of. Exactly. And you know, it's funny that you say that because I was actually having the same idea about the the kind of slog in the middle. It reminded me a little bit of the Harry Potter books and the Deathly Hallows, how like <laughs> you wander around in the forest forever and you're like, when are we going to get to the action in the story? But then you kind of need that time wandering in the forest to kind of mm -hmm. like get a sense of what it was like for the people in the story too. So that's what I was yes. also thinking about last night. There's, there's a lot of kind of looping in the middle when it's really hard to get trials up and going where you feel like you're just having the same story over and over and then everything kind of takes off at the end. So we don't want to spoil the entire book for you. It is a good reason. Read, but we are going to hit some of the, the high points of the story and especially the people because some of these people are names that you're probably familiar with, but some people I had never heard of. And it's, it's kind of sad yeah. that people have been lost to history who really are a huge part of the reason that we have um, hormonal contraception that we do right now. So we'll get into this a little bit more later, but one of the characters, Catherine McCormick, she actually in the book several times were in her correspondence to Margaret Sanger would say like, why does research take so long, essentially? Yeah. Like, this is taking forever. <laughs> and so I'm like, I feel you. I feel you, girl. She was the big <laughs> one that I always came away from impressed in the book and being like, wow, she needs to be a household name, just like Margaret Sanger, just like John Rock, because she was the one bankrolling this whole project. And on top of it, too, she wasn't just some wealthy donor that kind of like tossed mm -hmm. some money to cause like she wanted updates, she wanted to be involved, she was traveling and wanted to see what was yeah. going on in their lab. So you know, the, when they talk about the subtitle of the book, you have these four crusaders. And so you kind of have two men and two women, and they're all kind of pushing this project forward in different ways. And I think one of the big themes of the book is how these are all, how do they describe them? A group of brave, rebellious misfits, which is true. Yes. Like these are all people outside of kind of the traditional scientific norms who were mm -hmm. willing to take some risks, which again, we could argue about the, <laughs> the ethics because it could have all gone quite badly wrong. At multiple stages. <laughs> At multiple stages. Um, but, you know, that's sometimes you do have this combination of a certain group of personalities and that's what it takes to get what can seem like a really, you know, overwhelming even idea for something to actually get it done. <laughs> yeah. And it, it shows that this is a more complex story and these are complex characters mm -hmm. as humans are. So it is certainly not by any means a full on just hero story. 
Like, no. like these, these are flawed characters. But I think we should start with the one that everybody has probably heard of, Margaret Sanger. Mm-hmm. It was a nurse, and she is well known as starting the first family planning clinic. But originally, wasn't it what was the the Birth Control Federation? I know she had yeah. you know before the the PR turning it into this idea that we're going to focus on Planned Parenthood, that her yeah. original goal was really more about sexual awareness and expression and freeing women specifically from societal ideas about what could be involved in them actually maybe enjoying sex. <laughs> because up until that time, really, sex was for procreation and when it came to the women's side of things, because it was there was no, no way besides like, I guess they do talk about in the book several of the different remedies that different mm-hmm. cultures had come up with before this, but there was nothing that made women feel like they could relax and enjoy sex. Without that possibility and then fear of pregnancy. And especially, I mean, you kind of forget, I think the book does a good job of putting you back in that historical time frame of what it was like to have people that from the time you got married at 18, you would just be having a kid every single year. I mean, and what that yeah. does your body. And a lot of these doctors that were involved in this early research, it was because they were seeing so many young mothers dying, you know, yes. like just being constantly pregnant, their bodies not recovered, not able to, you know, take care of the children they have while also going through pregnancy. And this was really a life or death situation to try and find some way to pregnancy space. Like no one was even saying don't have children. It was like, I just, you know, need to not be instantly pregnant. <laughs> One woman was told, like, if you don't want to have another baby, just sleep on the roof. Right. (laughs) And I just wanted to read this one. So women sent a lot of letters to Margaret Sanger, um, just telling her about their plight and pleading for any kind of help, um, because she was very well known for both before her, well, kind of during, she she was a big part of the suffragist movement, too. So she was a big activist uh, in multiple different things, especially when it came to women's liberty. So this quote was from one of the letters that was sent to her. And it says, I am 30 years old and have been married 14 years and I have 11 children. I have kidney and heart disease. And one of my children is, this is not my language, defective and we are poor. Now, Mrs. Sanger, you can please help me. I am so worried and I have cried myself sick. I know I will go like my poor sister. She went insane and died. The doctor won't do anything for me. If I could tell you all the terrible things that I've been through with my babies and children, you would know why. I would rather die than have another one. Please, no one will ever know, and I will be so happy, and I will do anything in this world for you and your good work. Doctors are men and have not had a baby, so they have no pity for a poor sick mother. You are a mother, and you know, so please pity me and help me. Please, please. And this is the age that, I, was it Margaret Sanger, the story that she was like having diaphragm sewed into her coat or something? Or was that some, yes. Yeah. I mean, people, like any form of contraception was still, you know, if not illegal, um, you know, something that was highly frowned upon. And so those were the methods that were even there and they were not easy to get. And the main issue too is those methods were all visible to the partner. And so if you want him to use condoms or you have to go put in the diaphragm, that wasn't something that you could choose to do all on your own. And that was another big thing that was a motivator for Margaret Sanger. She wanted something that let women be in control of their own bodies. And that's where she actually came up with this term to call it birth control instead of contraception because she wanted it to be this idea that you can control your own bodies and have, as they say it, if women got to control how and when and how often they gave birth, they could control their own bodies and hold a kind of power never before imagined. So... Yeah. Yeah. And to bring us back to what was going on around that time, too, there was what was called the Comstock Act of 1873, which was also called the Chastity Laws. It made it illegal to send or distribute obscene, lewd, or lavacious, immoral, or indecent publications. And so that included not only like pornographic publications, but also any kind of descriptions of any kind of contraception or family planning. And the information that science was even giving people was not very useful. You know, they mentioned in here that doctors were instructing women that if they didn't want to become pregnant, they should only have sex during the safe period. And it says until the <laughs> 1930s, most doctors believed the safe period was in the middle of the menstrual cycle. Oh, dear. Which is actually like you're <laughs> most likely to conceive. And so, you know, you, you really don't have a lot of good options. So this idea that you would be writing a letter to anybody that you've heard might be able to give you birth control. I mean, it actually makes a whole lot of sense considering the other 
other things that were available right then. I don't think we got want to get too bogged down into the controversy of Margaret Singer, but the reason that you probably have also heard about her as a part of this, it also got linked into the idea of eugenics because she was definitely saw the fact that her ideas about control in bodies, it kind of overlapped with this other big movement at the time that was concerned about population control and how we had to get mm -hmm. this population control and growth under and from with that, there certainly was a subset that was all about, well, which population are you controlling? Which population do we want to control and which ones do we not want to control? Exactly. And so it's kind of hard to sort out the things that she did um, advancing one cause with it also being intertwined in that. And we are trying to keep this snack size. Yeah. But I think the part that was interesting to me in this book is realizing really how little, except in the initial parts, Margaret Sanger did because she was getting older. Like all of this stuff that you're hearing about is... Yeah, she was in her 70s when she came across this other character that we'll talk about. She was in her 70s when this all started. So it was the end of her life. Yeah, so she's kind of the, the driving force pushing all this. She's kind of the public face in the early beginning. But then by the time all this is actually really moving forward, you know, she's had a lot of health challenges. She's affected by dementia. She really has faded into um, more of the background in terms of it actually getting completed and released as the pill. Kind of going to the next character, um, Margaret Sanger was the one to approach this scientist. And basically, because of the Comstock laws and the beliefs at the time, no one would touch any kind of contraception research. Like no one wanted, they weren't able to get funding. The institutions didn't want to have that under their names. So Margaret Sanger went to this, uh, this scientist who was kind of... Um, Kind of a rebel. Again, it's this is like a career killing research. So you have to go to someone who's already killed their career <laughs> on their own. <laughs> Which is Gregory Goody Pincus. And so he had been kicked out of Harvard. And this is interesting because he was doing some uh, preliminary research on IVF in rabbits which is interesting. And he was kind of a character. He really liked the spotlight. He talked to the press probably more than he needed to. And so he brought this, this publicity to Harvard about, you know, you know, maybe we, we might, might not even need men in the future because we have this IVF thing that might happen. And <laughs> Harvard's like, yeah, yeah, we're not cool with that. You got to go, Pincus. And so he was had to establish his own institution in Worcester, Massachusetts. <laughs> I love saying that because you don't say how it's spelled. <laughs> Basically, Ma Margaret Sanger came to Dr. Pincus and was like, hey, I need to come up with some kind of contraception, preferably a pill that is pretty effective and is easy to take and has minimal side effects. And can you do that? And he's like, yes, I think I can do that. Because he had been working with progesterone and kind of in those IVF kind of studies, he had been looking at how progesterone affects the body. So he's like, yeah, I think I can maybe use a really high dose progesterone. So he had an assistant, MC Chang, who was somebody that you haven't heard. <laughs> and primarily because English was not his first language. And so he was doing a lot of the science research, but he was not doing any of the public communicating about it. So yeah, exactly. The two of them. And really, when you read the book, you're like, he was doing a lot of the like on the ground in the lab. He was living in the laboratory, which was just this yes. like rundown, <laughs> creepy building in Wooster with all the bunnies. And <laughs> yes. And he was, yeah, with the rabbits. And he said he would keep his lunch in the refrigerator next to like the, the sample, the rabbit samples. And yeah. I was like, oh, no, don't get that mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and it was based out of a, a home i mean if you look at pictures it's pretty fancy looking but it wasn't like an institution they called it an institute but it was part of it was in a garage it was a whole thing they were basically very much part of the fake it till you make it you know you're just like yeah i can do that i can make you a magic pill that'll yeah. control a yeah. pregnancy let's do this mm -hmm. so and do you want to talk about John Rock? I would love to talk about John Rock. John Rock is kind of how I first got interested in this because I had listened to, gosh, we're doing all these shout outs to podcasts, but I also enjoy Revisionist History by Malcolm Gladwell. And they had a whole long episode on John Rock. And it was fascinating to me to realize that one of these main drivers of the birth control pill was someone whose Catholic face was really important to him. And you see that throughout the book. It wasn't like he was trying to be a rebel and move away from Catholicism. Like he really believed and had a lot of good reasons to believe that the church would eventually come around to his way of thinking and see that this was just an extension of sort of a natural family planning method is that if, yeah. if that works because you're knowing when you're already post ovulation because of progesterone, well, this is just the same kind of thing that we're using the same hormones. It's a natural way of extending the safe window that you have already said is okay for intercourse. 
Yeah. And this happens during pregnancy. That's why we don't get pregnant when we're pregnant is like you have a higher level of progesterone. So we're, let's just do that. It's the same, same natural hormone. So you tried to explain that to the Catholic Church. It didn't really work. but It didn't work in the end, although it got closer than you might think. But I like in this early description, it's talking about how Rock had been experimenting with different methods of hormones. And before giving them to his patients, he would also inject himself to assess how much pain each dose packed <laughs> and presumably to make sure he wouldn't drop dead. So again, this is old science, right? You're like, ah. that's quite lovely of him. <laughs> yeah, I try this and see what happens. But that's basically all he did. They're like he did little in the way of preparation. He didn't ask his patients to sign informed consents. Like, he didn't no. do any of this stuff. It was more science was very different back in the, you know, yes. 30s through 50s when all this stuff is really kind of taking place. And he had a good reputation as a really good doctor. So his patients really trusted him. And so when he came to his patients who were infertility patients and said, hey, will you try this pill? Yes, it's going to stop you from ovulating, but maybe, maybe afterwards you'll get pregnant. A lot of people are like, yeah, sure. And that really was the the main initial driver. And that was, again, a lot more socially acceptable is this idea, like, I'm trying to help people get pregnant. They called it the mm -hmm. rock rebound effect, where you would kind of suppress your cycles for a while. And then when you'd go off of that, the idea was that now maybe you would have a better chance of getting pregnant. That uh, rock rebound effect sounds so metal. It's like metal. <laughs> yeah. And part of the other reasons that he's such a key figure is that he was the very charismatic one. Like they've several times in the book mentioned if you like put out central casting for like respectable doctor, that's who you get. He's like, you know, tall and has been in the field and gray haired and very you know, rock, right? Sturdy, just like the kind of person that you want to trust with your medical care. And he really devoted his life to this also because of having those early experiences as a doctor with seeing so many people suffering and dying in these situations. This was something that was really important for him. And Pincus died at, I think they said, age 64, but Rock lived into his 90s. And this was always kind of his main thing that he felt so proud of being a part of and accomplishing. So, you know, we are trying to keep it snack sized. I could talk about John Rock for a long time, but you have this really fascinating combination of the really kind of flashy, flamboyant, break the rules, this is get it done, of Margaret Sanger and Goody Pincus. And then John Rock is kind of this more studying you need that balance. I don't think it would have happened with just two people because he was always trying to dial everybody else in and be like, hey, Pincus, don't say that at the conference yet. We're not ready. And then Pincus would say it anyway. Or like, let's not bring it to the FDA yet. But then Pincus would be like, yep, I'm going to do it. And one thing about research, as you know, is yes, you can have the scientists and you can have the drive to get to that goal. But what you really need in research is funding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so where did we get that funding? <laughs> yeah. And that is our fourth crusader who also was the person I never heard of. And the one that I feel most like needs her shout out because none of this would have happened of course. So you had Catherine McCormick, who was basically a very wealthy widower that then took on causes. And that's the other thing. It's like so many of these stories have these sad backstories for why this mm -hmm. is important to them. And she had had a marriage with another upper class high society man who unfortunately soon after their wedding went downhill very quickly with mental illness and had to be institutionalized it was just it was a sad story sad sad story and she spent you know a lot of money a lot of time trying to find treatments trying to find ways to help him and when he eventually passed away then she was like well what else am i going to devote all this time and money to and she decided that but did she meet Margaret Sanger? Did Margaret Sanger come to her first? Is that how she got looped in? They knew each other through the suffragist movement. Of course, when she was married, she was really focused on the marriage and her husband who was ailing at the time. When he died, then she came back. It's like, well, I have all this money now and I want to get back into my activism. And so she knew of Margaret Sanger and her work. And it's like, hey, how can I support this birth control thing? She was also very like, sex is more than childbearing. We need to find a safer method for women to be able to enjoy sex. So she was very sex forward. This whole group was very sex forward. And again, she's the one bankrolling this whole operation. Like initially Planned Parenthood through Margaret Sanger is giving these like small amounts of funding, but it's just enough for like the bare minimum. And they're not sure if this is even going to be a project that'll work out. And it's all teetering on the edge of whether it's all just going to get stopped until she comes in. And when you read the book, you're like, oh, you know, 30000 But this is like, oh, yeah, $1.2 million in today's money for each year of funding. I mean, she was spending very, very large sums of money. 
money to be able to get this out of just the little hatch with the bunnies <laughs> and into like actual people and clinical trials, not as what we would think of as clinical trials at all. I think that's the biggest thing when you read the book, you're like, well, wow, these are some unethical things going yeah. on. But her <laughs> money and support and continued checking up on them all the time to be like, where are we going? How can we move faster? How can we get this done? Because like Margaret Sanger, she was also older and nearing the end of her life. And this was a project she really wanted to see through. And she was willing to do what it took to help drive it forward. Yeah, she was older than Margaret. So she was in her 80s by the end of all of this. She was a huge driver. She was basically a blank check yeah. for this. And this would not have happened without her. So it's amazing that her name isn't uh, more well known because she was very important. Do we want to go into the research a little bit? Mostly just to highlight how shocking to me it was like that, you know, when they start, first they start out going to the, as they call it, the insane asylum, and then they give go. Giving it to men, too. I know, giving it to men. And then even, I think the thing that was interesting is a lot of this is building on John Rock's early research, which was, again, with the people who were trying to get pregnant, and he was giving them all this progesterone. And the hardest part, I found this just really relatable for our patients, is he mentions that people receiving the hormones believed they were pregnant, no matter how much he assured them it wasn't possible and they were crushed when it finally because the being on all this progesterone made them feel so pregnant and so that's when they came up with this idea that you would have your break you would have your five days that you didn't take the progesterone so that you would get a period because that was the only way he could convince the women that they really weren't pregnant even though they totally felt pregnant that's where that 28 day pack with the placebo comes from. And that was also part of his way for both the FDA to quote unquote regulate cycles and for the Catholic Church to say, look, it's a normal menstrual kind of cycle. You have a period and all those kind of things. So interesting that your little pack that you open up and it has your three weeks of pills and one week of placebo, there are there are reasons for that. <laughs> oh my gosh, well, if we're going to mention that, I can't. Did you love the part at the end about the pack itself? Did you read the, yeah. yeah, so you have the little, because <laughs> once they finally get it approved, you just have a bottle, right? And so you just have a bottle that you've got to remember to take a pill every day. And you're like, did I take my pill yesterday? I don't know. And so you had a source of strain in many relationships too, where sometimes the part would be like, did you take your pill today? And then the woman would be like, stop asking, you know, just it was not a great dynamic. And so you had a man in Illinois who just after an argument about the pill, took a piece of paper and wrote the days of the week on the pill and then put one pill on each day of the week for kind of a month calendar. And then his wife would take a pill and they could look and see which one he'd done. And that worked well until one day they knocked it off the dresser. And that's when, because he also worked in some sort of industrial design, it's like, oh. I was just going to say he was an engineer, Yeah, he wasn't was an he? engineer. He's like, what if I just build a little pack with these little windows? And then he patented it. And then the drug company stole his idea and he had to sue them. But eventually, that's why we <laughs> ended up with our pill pack idea was from a marital argument about <laughs> there has to be a better way to keep track of the pill. I can just picture it in my mind, just like in the kitchen, yeah. like... <laughs> but yeah, just to kind of briefly go a little bit more into the research. So a lot of the trials were, like Anne had mentioned, some were in asylums where they would give the injections to men and women, where most of the, the subjects came from was from Puerto Rico. There were multiple reasons for that. Some were what are seemingly legitimate reasons and some that were questionable. Mm -hmm. And they started out trying to do it with medical staff in Puerto Rico. Like, oh, well, we'll just get all the nurses. Nursing and, students. Yep. Yeah. And again, it's not like you had a choice. It was like, yep, everyone who's in the nursing class has to sign up and get there. And these were very invasive studies. They were doing multiple pap smears. They were doing like all kinds of tests because they- Endometrial biopsies blood tests. Again, no one really kind of even knew, A, okay, we think this is going to work. We seem to see based on lab data and based on the people that it seems to stop people from getting pregnant. But like, does it have any kind of harmful side effects? I don't know. Let's go try it in Puerto Rico and see. It started off with the medical students and nurses, but they had super high drop-off rates. They couldn't keep their studies going. Even with the threat of bad grades, they couldn't keep them in. Yeah, which shows you again, <laughs> like side effects, especially in these early fairly high dose. We're hard headed us nurses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that eventually they moved on to 
you know, the very low income areas where people were just desperate enough to kind of try anything. And they also got some more local people who were encouraged by the cause who also were like, hey, I know there's this demand here. And the thing that I thought was really interesting is as it started becoming more people they were enrolling in Puerto Rico, the church locally um, sort of realized this was going on and they gave these fiery <laughs> sermons about like, you know, do not take the pill that we hear. Is, and people all of a sudden it drove enrollment. People were like, I want this pill that I heard at church. It's stopping me from getting pregnant. <laughs> it was like free advertising. It just <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like, how do I get that pill that the church told me I can't go on? Now, what is this? Tell me more. So most of the early studies um, were done in Puerto Rico. And one of the main characters that I want to shout out to is one of the doctors there, which was Edris Rice Ray. So she was kind of like the on the boots, kind of managing the study in Puerto Rico because the researchers couldn't be there all the time. So like Pincus and John Rock couldn't be there all the time. So she was kind of maintaining it there. And she was the one that pointed out all the side effects mm -hmm. and was like, hey, I'm really concerned about these side effects. And Pincus being Pincus <laughs> was like, ah, no, it's, you know, they're just probably bad historians. They probably don't know if they're having side effects, you know, <laughs> um, it's like, well, you know, they're having severe headaches and nausea and vomiting. And <laughs> but also, I mean, like you can see it's just a different mindset. I think they just weren't that concerned with the concerns of women. And they do mention Pincus did his own little mini experiment where he was pretty sure that a lot of it was just in people's heads. And so he did his own group of it was only like 20 or so, but he told people this one and then he gave a placebo one and he had he gave the people who were getting the placebo the long list of side effects that other people had talked about as well as the real one. And then he gave another group the real hormone, but gave him no instructions. And he found that the real pill with no instructions only had about 6% complaints versus sure. the placebo had 20 some percent complaining about all these side effects. So that kind of in his mind cemented that it was all in the head and that that's why he didn't have yeah, to worry about he it. He was really just like, oh, no, they, they're just making it up kind of thing, which is problematic. But his daughter took it. She went down as well to Puerto Rico to help out with the research. And yeah. while she was down there, I mentioned at some point to her dad that she'd gotten a boyfriend and was on the pill. And he was like, oh, are you having side effects? Like he, was, he, he wasn't at all like upset about it. He was just kind of like, oh, okay, sounds good. But it was so funny because on the opposite end for the subjects in the asylum, the male subjects, they were getting changes in their voice and they had testicle shrinkage and and they like stopped that immediately. Mm -hmm. And there, it's, it wasn't really quite clear why they chose to do that in that population. But. Well, that's also one of the other things that was interesting to me in the book is near the end, again, Pincus got ill and died soon after this happened. And had that not happened, he was interested in looking more at contraceptive options for men. That was kind of what was going to be his next path of research. And Catherine McCormick was also, you know, encouraged about this and willing to fund it. So you do kind of feel like maybe if some of this momentum had kept going that direction, we would have more mm -hmm. options now. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to touch on a couple of things about the book itself, like the, the writing and just the, the yeah. style and some of the things that I kind of took a little bit of issue with because I'm a, I, I'm a feminist. So I get a little bit riled up. There's a couple of places in the book, the descriptions, it was very good description. I really liked the description of the characters in a lot of ways and how the story was presented. But in some ways, there was still some of this stereotypic language when used to describe a woman versus a man. So like Margaret Sanger, when they're talking about her being so sex forward and everything, one of the quotes was describing Margaret Sanger a sexy slip of a woman, a redheaded fireball of lust and curiosity. And I'm like, would you describe the man that way if it were a man doing? I don't think maybe so. if he was a sexy slip of a man. <laughs> maybe if he was a sexy slip of a, a redheaded red fireball. fireball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there was a couple things like that of like, man, mm, and it's just the words that we choose. It's just interesting when you look at how we choose to describe women too, um, that you can see, especially in a book that's talking about gender roles and the liberation of women that I'm like, but yet we're still using this language to describe somebody who is much more than being a sexy slip of a woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just, so that was like my one big complaint. But other than that, like it was super fascinating. I think it did a great job of making, you know, what can be 
a little bit dry in terms of history and science. Definitely an interesting story. And I think um, if you listen to our episode on medications um, and development of Clomid, and you kind of see again just what a magical time the 1950s to 1960s were. I mean, you were just kind of this wild west of science, just like we talk about in our Clomid episode, like all this stuff luckily it was all happening kind of just before the thalidomide um it really was no win for people because otherwise i think definitely you would not have had so many doctors just prescribing this new pill i think the thing that was really interesting to me was to realize that the birth control pill or the pill as they <laughs> basically pr wise got it referred to as was first approved in 1958 and only for married women yeah and it was approved not for contraception. This was such a brilliant target from the drug company when they went for approval. It was approved for the treatment of irregular cycles. And then they listed on the side effects that it you know, may inhibit ovulation. But again, that was just a side effect of this pill you could take to help fix your irregular cycles. And again, it was also marketed as an infertility treatment. You're going to fix those irregular cycles by taking this pill. And that's sort of this nice soft sell. So from 1958 until 1960, when it's finally then goes back to get approval as a contraception, you have this kind of exponential growth, which basically was was their clinical trial. Yeah, it was only like 134 women. It's 130 women, but that's why they did the, the clever thing that stats always do, where instead of looking <laughs> at people, you look at what's the specific thing. So they reported the menstrual cycles because they were having people take it for multiple months. And they submitted data and showed that in 1,279 menstrual cycles, you had not found a single pregnancy. And you're like, yes. man, over a thousand. That sounds amazing. Of course, I want this wonder <laughs> pill. And they realized that sounded much more impressive than 130. And so they basically just yeah, let people prescribe it and then figured, well, if there's something seriously wrong, we'll hear about it. <laughs> and you have these interesting quotes and letters from people that were working in medicine at the time saying like, yeah, I was so nervous until the first people who went off it got pregnant and finally gave birth because we didn't know. Mm -hmm. We were like, are all, the, are all the babies going to be girls? Are they going to have issues? Like no one knew and they were just willing to find out, <laughs> which also kind of shows you how desperate that need was for some way to control and space pregnancies and, you know, have some sort of options beyond what was available. So I think you do just get that sense of time. Um, it mentions also in the book that in the early 1950s, only 90% of homes had televisions. And by mm -hmm. the end of the decade, 90% did. And you do just feel like this is a decade where people are just, the future is now, right? The technology is just growing. And so this I think all just goes along with it. And I think if this had been trying to happen in any other time period, people would not have been as willing to take the kind of risks that were done. And it, they're really lucky that it worked out. But yeah, it's, it's a really, really interesting story. When I was reading this, and as Anne had mentioned, I finished this within the last two days. <laughs> <laughs> but if I would have had extra time, I would have really liked to talk to my grandma about oh, yeah. this. And like, do you remember when this happened? What was the atmosphere like when all this was going down? And then on the other side, if my dad's mom was still living, she was a, a Catholic and she had 10 children. So it'd be, it would have been yeah. interesting to compare those two experiences. Well, they do have their quote in there from Hugh Hefner, right? Someone asked him in an <laughs> yeah. interview, if you remember the first time that you were, you know, slept with someone that was on the pill, he's like, no, I mean, I wouldn't have any way of knowing, but I know that everyone I slept with by the 60s was on it. <laughs> and But that was a huge part of the fact that you didn't have any way of knowing. It was a method of birth control that was private, that did not require the buy-in of a partner, that you could be taking this and no one had to know. And that was really a game changer in terms of people's ability to make other decisions for their lives. Then 1960 was the big year that it was FDA approved for contraceptive purposes. And if you want to have some entertaining slash cringeworthy um, Googling, just just Google uh, birth control pills, early advertisements, oh because my gosh, uh, the yes. one that is like the worst, it says like, that's right, boys, I'm on the pill. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I could just. And she's like surrounded by all these guys. And I'm like, oh, pinching my nose. Well, they mentioned <laughs> the drug company giving early prescribing doctors the like gold paperweight of the naked buxom woman who's breaking oh. out of her chains <laughs> because she is <laughs> breaking the chains. So yeah, it was a different age. <laughs> that also sounds very metal. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, well, this is definitely a big snack. A so big hopefully snack. you were hungry, but it was it was a really fun one. Um, and if you have any kind of interest in history or or just you know fertility history, anything like that, this, it, this is really kind of a fascinating read. It is definitely. I've got like my bunch of underlines, four pages of notes. Like I, I really did enjoy this book. I learned a lot, and um, yeah, it makes me appreciate happy anniversary pill. So many important functions that we've talked about on so many of our episodes. All right, I think that covers it. We will see you in, I don't know, a few days. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of the Whole Pineapple Podcast. We hope it was helpful. If you know someone who could benefit from hearing the podcast, we hope you'll share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the Whole Pineapple on your favorite podcast app. Every rating and review makes us easier to find. This podcast is sponsored by Seattle Reproductive Medicine and is produced by Audiotocracy Podcast Production. We'll see you next time. Have a delicious week.